everyone, this is Styling Components for React UI Kids. I'm Javier Velasco, that's my Twitter handle. I work for a company called Audience and that's my beautiful dog, the most beautiful thing in the world, by the way. And I'm the author of this uh, UI kit, you may know about it, it's called React Toolbox and it's a library of React components that is implementing material design guidelines. And at first it was built using CSS modules and SAS, then we wanted to switch to post CSS to make it like something more standard, but uh, it's still in the process and probably it's not gonna be finished at all. But still, there are some companies that are using the UI kit for some time for internal apps like Amazon, Netflix, and Walmart. And the truth is that there are some design flaws apart from using just CSS models, but some of these flaws comes from CSS model itself. And the most important problem for me is uh, the customization API, because it's based on CSS modules. The good thing at first was that importing a CSS module from your JavaScript is gonna hash the class names. So you are skipping some usual problems that you have when you are styling an application with CSS. But the, the problem is that hashing those class names is also hiding the, the elements that are composing a component. So if you want to change the style in a particular place of your component, you have no way of writing a selector to overwrite those styles, which is like the traditional way of overwriting styles. And also, the most important problem is that it's going to force you to a, a webpack setup that it's not actually easy at all. Most of the issues with React Toolbox, when people want to get started with the library, library, sorry, um, the most important problem is that they cannot figure out how to install the whole thing. Like you need the CSS modules, but with local scoping and stuff. But still, these companies are using the library, uh, the library and it's actually an, an, an important UA kit. I am getting constantly a lot of different issues and people asking how to do stuff and when it's gonna be whatever component improved. So I was dealing a lot with this Deming customization problem. How can I solve this thing and make components really reusable? Because we were told that with React we are writing components that we are not going to need to write another dropdown. But that's not true. We end up like copy and pasting code always, right? So I have a question for you. Have you ever built a date picker component? Some of you, any of you? Yeah, some of you? Yeah, a lot of people there. Yeah, cool. Well, cool, it's not that cool, actually. <laughs> but do you think the component you built was really customizable? I mean, really customizable. Do you think so, sort of? No? No, that's good to know. So let me, sh let me show you something. This is a React Toolbox core logic for the date picker that is customized using uh, Airbnb business styles. So what you are seeing there in the left side is an implementation of this date picker for the web. And what you're about to see on the right side is the same logic, but using React Native components. And it's exactly the same picker, same logic. So that's it, it's worked very nicely. So did I capture your attention more or less with this? Hope so. So I want to talk about uh, Deming and customization. First question is, what do we understand? Because customization is some, sometimes misunderstood. First of all, I want to speak about Deming. What is Deming to me? So Deming to me is like, one comes and says, uh, I want to change the color scheme, so every component in the library is gonna look with a different color, like changing the primary color, for example. We are shipping the actual box with this uh, blue material design curl. Maybe you want to change that, and it's supposed to be changed in the whole library, right? The good thing is that you can predict what, what values uh, you will need to change in the future. Like, for example, it's pretty obvious that the color can be changed, but also you can change stuff like spacing, font size, um, this sort of thing, right? But then you have the style customization. By style customization, I understand something like the title in the card is too small, for example, and I want to change it, and I don't care about guidelines, I just want to make that title bigger. 
And the bad news is that you can't really predict that. How can you think about those values are going to be changed? You cannot give a declarative API to change all of those values. It's just not possible. But still, you have to give some way to change it, right? And finally, render customization. And this is something that is not done by anybody, I think. And here's the case. You have this date picker that I just showed you. And the date picker is rendering the weekdays just with the capital letter, for example. And you want to change that to the full days, okay? the full word, the full name. So it's even possible. It is possible, and I show you why it is possible. But the thing is that covering these three, then in style customization and rendering customization, you can take customization to the limits. You can do whatever you want, actually. You can build a component and then add the styling some way, give this API, and you can either create a new component with whole different styles or, or change a specific part of the component. But before getting on in, into how this can be done, let's think for a second how React is facing styling or how can we deal with styles in React components. And the truth is that we were told that um, a React component can be considered as a function of some state. That function of the state is going to generate a view. But CSS is not taking part by default there. If you want to start a component, you just add, add a class name, make sure CSS appear in the application some way, and the browser is going to be the one responsible for applying those styles, right? So the only link that exists between your component and the CSS are those class names. And to get them in, in this model, you need building and setting up. We have now in the future, well, it's not future now, a specification of CSS, these custom properties, these sort of variables, right? But if you care about all the browsers, you still need to process everything and generate the regular CSS style sheet with the, uh, with the processed values, right? So this needs setup. And I learned that it's not possible to give you an UI kit, a set of components that you have to process on your side. That's a huge issue. But what if we consider a style a function of the state too? And think about it. You can have a button. If the button is pressed, the style is going to change. right? And that press can be considered as a state of the component too. So we are handling in that model CSS as React does with HTML. We are no longer writing HTML. We have components that are based with React in, in, uh, with, um, in JavaScript and CSS, and that's all. But now, we can just skip that by using CSS in JS, right? And I'm going to refer one more time to style components. It was mentioned a lot during the day. But it's my favorite right now because of the API, but you can use anything else, OK? Here's the, the, the idea. Say you have a button like this, and you want to build this button using React elements as the, as the primitive, as the most basic value. That's going to render to a dot node, right? To a button. And then if you have this prop primary, you have to add this BDN primary class name, or just BDN depending on the property. You have to calculate what's going to be the class name that is going to be rendered in the component in order to apply those styles. And that's happening when you are using React elements as primitives to build your component. But with style components, we already saw the API today, so I think I'm going, I can go faster with this. You just call the style components API using template strings. You pass the styles that you want for, to, for that component by default. And then the interesting part is that you can interpolate a function that is going to receive the properties. So what you return there is a piece of CSS and not a class name. And this is interesting because we are changing the abstraction level. We are not thinking about class names, but thinking about style properties. And we don't care about the priority of the selector because we are no longer using selectors or anything. That's style components or whatever you're using responsibility. 
but we are just saying that when the component is primary, it should have this background white and that color, right? And in both cases, the button could be rendered like something like this. So there's a difference here. You can use React elements as primitives, or you can use component as primitives. In the first one, the style is not going to be bundled by default. You have to configure the whole thing, Webpack, whatever model bundler you're using. But in the second one, using component primitives, the styles are going to be bundled in the component. If you're using something like style components or any other CSS and JS library. Then the state is mapped to a combination of class names, but in this other case, we are just mapping class names to properties, to CSS properties. That feels natural. And also, there is no built-in strategy in traditional CSS to get them in, but in CSS, the library is going to be responsible of giving you an API for them in. And overriding styles, which is very important for, for me, relies on selector priority, while we using component primitives, it can rely on JavaScript and in the library you are using. It doesn't matter if it's just uh, interpolating values at the end of a template string or if it's merging objects. So I'm going to show you now how can we solve Deming, on how can we solve the style customization using style components, but I want to insist you can use something else if you want. So we have this button component and we can interpolate these properties right here, and we are going to get the main color from a dim object. That dim, that dim object should be provided some way, and I'm sure you already know about the provider pattern. So in style components in particular, you can just wrap your application with the dim provider and pass that object. So deming is actually solved by style components already. Okay. But with style customization, it's not the same thing. There is an API in style components that allows you to wrap, uh, uh, to call the style function, pass it the component, and then those styles that you're passing are going to be applied to the same component. But I'm going with a different approach. When you write the styles, optionally, you can interpolate at the end a property styles, for example, at the end of that portion of CSS. That's going to override any piece of CSS that you pass using this property. Just like that. So if you want to override that bottom styles, you can declare a piece of CSS just like this, and then pass it down to the component. And what is really interesting in this approach is that you can still interpolate a function that is receiving the properties. And this is really, really powerful, because it's going to allow you to add properties that are not originally defined by the original component. Right? I may have a button that is a primary button, and I can add a secondary property that is not initially included in the original button component. And you would use it like this. Just render your button, pass the property with the CSS, and those styles are going to be overridden. But this is a very easy scenario, because we have a component that just rendered to one element. What if it's a more complex component? What if it's something that is composed by more than one node? Like, for example, a counter component. This example is showing a very basic component, actually, but that is composed by two different nodes. You have this wrapper and the count. And then what we can do is to receive this style property that is going to be an object whose keys are the names or of the primitives that we are going to use to render it. So you're receiving the styles.wrapper and styles.count which is exactly the name that I'm using for the primitive that is rendering this component. Then the override could look like something like this. You just create an object and assign to that wrapper and count keys the piece of CSS that you want to override. And it is this, this easy. Okay. Now, let's jump into the interesting part, which is uh, render customization. And I'm going to use dependency injection, or in this case, just component injection. 
So you have this previous example of the counter, and obviously those two primitives, wrapper and count, should come from somewhere. So the most regular case is that you're going to import that wrapper and that counter in your file. That makes it impossible to replace them. But what happens if you change this into a factory where you are injecting that wrapper and count components? And then you return a function or a class or whatever. You return just a component that is going to internally orchestrate how those primitives that you are passing are handled. Right? So creating a component, a counter component in this case, could be as simple as importing a get counter factory and then calling that factory, passing the nodes that you want to render internally. And of course, you can interpolate at the end of each piece of CSS the interpolation of that potential override that you might get in the future. The cool part about this is that you, can, you don't need to use a style component. Um, the API became very popular, and you have Glamour, you have React Fela, and you have a lot of CSS uh, in JS libraries that allows you to create components is great. So this same example for the counter component can be declared using Fela components with the syntax of create component, just like style components. It's very, very similar. And also, you can use the same strategy for the overrides, because you can spread that potential property at the end of the object, right? And guess what? You can do the same thing with styles component native. And you can use native, React Native components to generate uh, this kind of uh, uh, components from the same factories. But s if you tell this approach like that, it might sound that like it is not flexible at all. So imagine that I want to change something. I want, for example, to have a red background when the count value is higher than 10, which is like a very weird case. And it's depending on props and maybe additional props that I can pass in the future or whatever. So you can change this uh, approach, this rendering, like this. You can add a spread of a function call to what I call a pass-through function. This is a function that is going to be called by using the node name that you're using for your primitive, the props, and the instance. And the responsibility of this function is just to return an object with the properties that should be added to that primitive. In this case, we are just calling the function with a wrapper and a count, and it is supposed to return either an empty object or some properties that can be spread for those primitives. So to solve this example, we could have a pass-through function just like this. You're receiving the node name, props, and instance again. And in case the node name is the wrapper, I'm going to return a counter property that is received in the counter component. But this is the props that counter is the counter component itself, not the node, right? So now the node wrapper the component that we are passing to render the wrapper node is going to be aware of that counter property. What makes possible to interpolate a function that receives the counter and puts the color as red in case it's higher than 10. So this allows you to do pretty much, pretty much everything you want, right? Because when you create your component by calling this factory, you're going to be able to tell if there are additional properties that are passed to the component on top of it and how the internals of this component uh, are orchestrated. So with this approach, and back to React Toolbox, uh, how does it relate to it? And basically, what I want to do is like a final version. I'm OK with these APIs, and I am OK with the customization and then strategy and everything. So I want to write this uh, final version, release it, and maintain it, just like that. So it could be React Toolbox version 3, which is going to still be a material design library. But I'm going to strip from that another library, another package, what is going to be React Toolbox core. 
And that library is, by, is going to be composed by factories, high order components, and utilities that are used internally to build React toolbox. And between the examples of uh, uh, the functions that, that, that are going to be used internally, we have this, um, let me see if it's working here. Uh, it's not possible, actually. Give me a sec. Yeah, there you go. An example of a higher order component that is using that I am using right now is not released yet. Is this with navigation? This with navigation higher order component is going to allow you to decorate a style component just like this, this node component right here. And it's going to allow you to navigate using the, the keyboard by adding some additional properties. So this example, in case you're wondering, because the level is so small and probably it's not the best moment to read it, is published in my Twitter account. And basically what you get is just calling this function, these two functions here, we create a list that is uh, scrollable by using the, the keyword, right? And, uh, well, for some reason it's not working here. But anyway, just check it out the, the example. I hope to release this by December, the whole thing, React to Box 4 and the other one. No React Native for now, that's just the proof of concept. So that's all I, pretty much all I have to say, so that's it.